Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for uh, Winter Sewing. Uh, a couple of things we, before we begin. My name is Xavier Duran. I am the Adult Programming Coordinator for the Lyle Library District. Uh, a couple of things before um, we start. Uh, this program will be recorded and available on YouTube soon. So if there's something that you missed during the presentation, no worries. The program will be listed on YouTube, um, as, as I like to kind of give the um, the, the, our, the the timeline of soon. Um, uh, what else? Um, yes, if you have any questions or um, anything like that, you're more than welcome to put in the Q&A or in the chat window. Um, and um, with that said, if we do experience any technical difficulties, um, give us a second or give us a minute or two to figure out how to uh, remedy the problem. And um, aside from that, just extend a little bit of grace as, the, the, as we try to adjust to the new normal. Um, with that said, um, I'm gonna hand it over to our uh, wonderful, incredibly um, knowledgeable master gardeners, uh, Jan and Cynthia. Go ahead and hand it over to you. Great, okay, welcome everyone. Um, did anyone bring a needle and thread? No? Okay, great, then you're in the right winter sewing class. I know I say that at the beginning of every class, but it never gets old for me. So we're <laughs> gonna be talking about winter sowing of seeds right now. And I'd like to present Cynthia, who is going to run the PowerPoint. Hello. And there's Cynthia. So, okay, we're gonna kind of tag team this, um, this presentation today. So you get two for the price of one uh, Master Gardeners. Isn't that special? So winter sowing, it's something we can do right now, something we need to get our hands in the dirt now after such a long a winter already. And now is a perfect time to do that. Oh, here is our ad for the Extension Office. These are all the things that the University of Illinois Extension offers you, if only you go to their website and check them out. All right, so winter sowing is a method of sowing seeds in containers during the winter. You let them germinate naturally outside, and then you transplant the seedlings once you're gonna plant everything else in the yard. So no indoor lights or special equipment are needed. So how does it work? You're gonna plant seeds. We're gonna go over the containers, but uh, these are all kinds of containers that we can use, milk jugs, water jugs, um, are a good thing to do. We're gonna plant the seeds in here. Whoops, back up. Sorry, my bad. Um, and then you're gonna put them outside. Now, seeds take their cue from mother nature as to when they will germinate. Some seeds need to be frozen for a certain length of time. If you're doing native seeds, you may know that they need 30, 60, some of the 90 days of cold freezing temperatures. So this is a perfect method to do native seeds. Um, and the other seeds that are out there, like I have almost 80, oh, I have over 80 containers now on my patio, and some of them just don't care. If they're frozen now, the only time that it would be a problem is if you planted them too early and they started to germinate, and then they got really frozen, that would kill them. But if you're just doing it now, this is the perfect time. And then transplant, oh, so I don't, can we see this? Cynthia, I only see you, so I don't know if this is... Um, so I'll stop sharing so you can show. I still don't see me, so I don't know if this is showing. Hold on a second, let me get to this here. <clears throat> so if anybody sees this, it's my winter sewing containers in the snow, and then this is what they look like in May. You know, it's not letting me stop sharing, so stand by. Oh. So no one's seeing this? No, it's not letting me. Xavier, are you, are you there? Can you um, un, like stop showing my presentation? Because it's not letting me do it. Um, oh, there's my big finger. Okay, here we go, okay. Okay, all right. So here we'll show the picture if it's not too glary. This is a winter sewing in the winter under all that snow. Of course, now I can't even see my containers because there's so much snow, but this is then what it looks like in, the, in May when you're ready to plant. There's all kinds of wonderful things in there. 
So that's why we do it. I have like a 95% success rate. I have been doing this since 2008. And um, I do all kinds of things, natives, herbs, perennials, annuals, trees. I've even done a couple of trees, um, shrubs. So and there's everything that we can do in this. So um, it works. Next slide, maybe. So again, they will um, germinate when they're ready. Some need that freezing time, some don't care. And when it starts to um, get warmer, that's, that's when they will all start to germinate. So do we have, yeah, some of the seeds needs a stratification period, which is that period of cold and warm, freezing, thawing, freezing, thawing to soften up their seed coat. Some of them need scarification, like you may have seen in the seed packet to nick a little hole in that seed. Uh, the freeze-thaw, freeze-thaw cycle outside does that already for you. So why do you want to winter sow? Well, it's inexpensive. It takes less time than indoor seed gardening. Uh, the seeds grow naturally in upcycled containers. They're hardier. The plants themselves are hardier uh, plants than anything that you might start inside. They're more resistant to the cold at the end of the season. You see that beautiful tithonia there with, in October with some snow on the ground. That's a hardy plant. And there's certainly a wider selection of seeds versus what you can get at a local grower. I mean, just check out your seed catalogs. So indoor seed starting is time consuming. It takes up space. It requires special equipment. You need uh, lights on it. You need to water at the right time. Don't you dare go away for a weekend because those seeds might need watering. And you, if you're not there, they're dead. And you get those fungus gnats that fly around and they need to be hardened off when it comes to that time. So the downside of direct seeds starting outside, and I kind of encourage everybody, especially with the native to plant seeds directly outside, um, but you're in competition with hungry birds and critters. Uh, there could be some heavy rain events that will wash those seeds away. And my big thing is like, will I recognize it when it comes up? Because I'm doing every year, I'm doing a few more new to me native plants that I may not recognize. So if you have some outside and you have some in your container, then you can check as they're growing to see what you might have. So you can start winter sowing, we say, from the winter solstice on December 21st until springtime. There's um, other things that you can plant later, like in March and April, but I do most of my stuff really in January. So uh, you don't wanna start it before December 21st because as I said, if it starts to absorb water, then and then we get freezing temperatures, then those seeds will die. So you wanna wait, make sure until the temperature is consistently cold. Okay, Cynthia? Okay. So we're gonna to to now talk about uh, winter sowing supplies. And um, there's, it may seem like a lot when we first talk about it, but it's far less than the supplies that you're gonna need for indoor seed starting. So primarily you're going to need a recycled container. Um, you're gonna need potting soil, seeds, and then what I call other stuff, which is like hole punches, um, tape or uh, twist ties, scissors, um, a weatherproof marker or a paint pen, um, and just things that are gonna help us actually put together the container. And we'll go into each one of those. In terms of the containers, um, they're, it's best to use plastic containers. Um, we like to use repurposed because why not? They're everywhere. Um, it needs to be translucent or clear, meaning your hand must be visible through the plastic. If you can't see your hand, then you cannot use that. Then the, the sun will not be strong enough to actually give the warmth that the seedlings need. Um, it should hold about four inches of soil. And then um, depending upon what kind of seed you're sowing, you need to provide enough headroom, about four inches or so. But if you do natives, you can do like the flat clamshells um, and really not have that much headroom because they're more hardy in our area. You can start taking off the, the lid much earlier than um, non-native or um, 
um, tender types of, of plants and vegetables. Um, as I mentioned before, clamshells, um, what I mean by that are like, um, uh, let me have one here, for things that hold salad greens or berries, those kinds of containers, I love using those. They're great because they have a hinge. You don't have to worry about attacking, you know, making sure it's attached by tape or twine, and um, they stay they stay closed, which is really nice because it can get really windy out there, and you want to make sure that your top stays closed. Do you want to talk about the label, or do you want me to? Oh yeah, please do. Uh, the label on some of the strawberry containers or the salad containers really needs to come off because it's going to block the sun from those seeds underneath it. So I have found the easiest way to do that is to hold a hair blow, a blow dryer against it. And you want to have patience. You want to do it long enough with just enough heat to soften the glue that's on here so that you can rip it up and pull it off. Some admittedly are easier than others, but most of them come off really nice if you wait long enough. So you don't want it too hot. You don't want to blister the container nor your leg because you'll be holding this between your knees here. So, um, but the label needs to come off. Um, if there's any residue, you can use some Goo Gone or olive oil or peanut butter or something to get the rest of that off, but uh, the label itself should come off. Yep. Um, Good examples of containers. Um, I like using gallon milk or water jugs. Um, also juice containers, um, vinegar jugs, as long as they're translucent. You can even do takeout, uh, food takeout containers, deep serving trays, um, clamshells, two liter soda bottles. Um, and I know some people have really good luck with um, roasting pans and clear plastic lids. Okay, so um, there are some things you need to keep in mind when you do select the containers. So if you're going to be doing this year after year, which we certainly hope you will, um, you may want to consider using square containers or more rectangular because then it can stack really easily. It saves on space and it saves on space when you have a bunch of them outside. Um, the smaller the container, the faster it's going to dry out. Dry soil or dry seeds and then dry seeds are dead seeds, unfortunately. Um, also, Try to avoid using containers that held caustic liquids. Um, some people don't mind using that for um, things that they're not gonna be eating, but I just try to stay away from them at all, if at all possible. Um, also, two liter soda bottles that taper at the bottom. I think um, Coke products do this now. It's better to handle, um, obviously, but that's really not, not that great for seed starting because it's gonna be very difficult to get the root balls out of the bottom of that tapered container. Um, also, we're seeing more and more containers being made of biodegradable materials, which disintegrate outdoors. That's great. Not great for seed starting, though, so be careful. And then, um, as I mentioned before, clamshells that hold salad greens work really well. I think um, Organic Girl is a, is a brand that I've seen in various stores. Also, Aldi has um, a line of square containers that I use all the time, um, and they, are, they work really well. And Jan, I think you said before that you know some plastic containers usually have like a three-year um, life cycle, is that right? Uh, well, with the milk containers, uh, I, I get about three years out of them before the sun makes them just too brittle and the top won't stay on, that won't be hinged anymore. And what I do with the, uh, the uh, milk and water jugs is I store them in the garage in the off season and I have seven foot bamboo poles stuck inside of a, um, an umbrella stand and I just thread them up so that they are vertically stored and out of the way. But you can figure about three years worth of, and you, the best part is you don't need to clean these again. You don't need to sterilize them year after year. You just fill them up with dirt and you're good to go. Good. And speaking of dirt, um, you wanna choose a potting soil that is light and fluffy and it drains well. Um, and try to get the highest quality you can afford. Um, there is a lot of different potting soils out there and usually the ones like at dollar stores or you know, to the low, really, really, really inexpensive ones are very thick and you have bits of plastic. Some, I've caught um, a couple cigarette butts in, in some of those, not good. So those don't drain really well enough and uh, I had some seeds die as a result because the, the drainage was bad. So get light, fluffy potting soil. Um, you definitely do want to avoid these kinds of soils because sometimes soils can be really tricky. There is garden soil, topsoil, 
but um, you do definitely don't want to use the seed starting mix. Now, there are a lot of online resources for uh, seed starting, and some people swear by using seed starting mix. I found that it just doesn't provide enough nutrients for the amount of time that the seeds are going to be outside. Um, also, you want to avoid garden soil and topsoil because they're too heavy and they may have microbes and diseases in them. Um, also, mixes that have water crystals can sometimes retain too much water and your seeds will rot. And that's, that's no good. And then homemade compost, not a great idea because you cannot control what kind of microbes are in there. It may not have gotten hot enough to kill the bad stuff. So you stay away from that. And then um, succulent or cactus potting soil, that is too porous, too sandy. It's not going to retain the moisture that's needed. Um, as Jan mentioned also earlier in terms of the seeds, you can do a lot more than just flowers. I've grown tomatoes, I've grown peas, um, as, in addition to the vegetable, and, I'm sorry, annuals and perennials. I've started doing a lot of natives because that's, they're from here, they can take it, they're tough plants and they're really good candidates for seed starting. Um, so when you go for packets of seeds in the store and there's lots of different seeds packets out right now, a lot of big box stores and, and uh, nurseries and whatnot, um, there are certain clues on the packages that tell you that they're really good candidates for seed starting or for winter sowing right now. And words like stratification that Jen mentioned, meaning it needs cold, pre-chilling, um, put in the refrigerator for 30 days, um, reseeds, wildflower, sow in early spring. Also names that show environmental um, areas like prairie, mountains, swamp, plains are good signs as well as uh, areas of the, the world that are temperate like Canada, Siberian, polar, or oriental, that tells you that they're really good candidates for seed starting right now. And here's an example of that. These were some seeds um, that actually I planted in January. And I saw, oh, it says, like for example, on the upper left, uh, it said direct seed outdoors as soon as soil can be worked in the spring, meaning that we can, seed, uh, we can start these seeds right now. Also, the one in the middle says cold moist stratification. It's a clue. Um, and the bottom one said early winter, late fall, and a storage period in the refrigerator. So those are big, big, uh, big red hot indicators that you can sow these, seeds, uh, sow these seeds right now. And also make sure you hold on to those seed packets if you do have seed packets or if seeds you do get from those, um, because you're gonna wanna find out what the growing um, conditions are that they're going to need after you've sprouted them. So hold on to those. Um, in terms of seed sources, Lots of places you can get them. Um, if you go via the internet, make sure you go to, to reputable seed sources and seed companies. Um, also, obviously, retail garden centers in your areas, big box stores. And I've had a lot of luck with seeds from the dollar store. 25 cents a packet. I've grown plant, I've grown um, uh, perennials, annuals, and vegetables with 25 cent seed packets. It's been surprising. Um, also, you can save your own in the fall. And if you haven't done that yet, there's really good information from um, our extension seed saving webinars that you can find on YouTube, the recordings. Um, also, the Field Museum has a series of field guides to saving seeds. And they're just, it's, it's, it's like a rabbit hole of information. You find so many great things that you kind of forget what you're looking for to begin with. So at least that's what I do. Um, also, seed swaps in um, winter or early spring are very popular, mm -hmm. usually in the olden days of like last year and the year before. Um, local, local plant groups, the Morton Arboretum I know has one, the Chicago Botanic Garden sponsors an in-person seed swap. Um, and there's also a company in Decorah, Iowa called the Seed Savers Exchange. And um, they have a website where people, like everyday gardeners, have seed to share. And all you have to do is pay the postage and they'll send you seeds. So that that's a really good place to get um, uh, quality seeds. Um, okay. And a note about hybrid seeds. They may not, if you collect seeds from a hybrid plant, um, they may not, and you wanna plant them, they may not give you what you're looking for. It may not be what you thought it was. Um, there's a 50-50 chance because it has different parents. So it may have the attributes of one parent over another. You know, kind of like children, you never know what kind of what you're gonna get. But unlike children, um, with plants, you can toss out the ones that you don't like and keep the ones you like. <laughs> I worry about that. Are you going to see a lot of seed packets that say that they're hybrid tomatoes and squash plants? 
it's okay to plant those now. You're going to get what that seed packet says. What we're saying is not to save the seeds from something from that packet that, you get, that you're going to grow this year because the seeds from those plants will not be the same as what came in that packet. So uh, there's a ton of hybrids. You know, everybody wants new and the newest and the greatest. And so the plant people are working really hard to cross a lot of different plants together. So that's why we're getting a lot of hybrid plants. And that's great for this year, but don't save those seeds. Right. Okay, so in terms of the other types of tools that you need for winter sowing, um, you will need uh, a hole punch and twist ties or twine, which is one way that you can seal the, the tops and bottoms of the containers. Um, you'll also need scissors. Um, you also need a sharp object for punching drainage holes, as well as a weatherproof marker or a paint pen. And then um, optionally, depends on where you're gonna do this in your home or your garage, you could use a table covering, a cutting board and a ruler. Um, so just make sure you do it in a place where it's okay if it's gonna get a little dirty. Jan, don't you usually do it like in your kitchen sink? Uh, yes, the way I do it is uh, I will, are we gonna go through the cutting of this? I'll do the cutting of this one. Yeah. You know how this, I'm going to, um, I'm going to stop the presentation um, right here, so we, so Jan can show you how to cut the containers. Okay, I've already cut this one apart, but I'm going to use what I've used since 2008. This is a pretty sharp letter opener, so we're going to put a hole in here, and we're going to actually, it's a little bit easier after you've punctured the hole, to use scissors and cut all the way around. If you need to mark it with a black pen first so you don't go all over the place, that's a good thing to do as well. So I'm going to cut it. And then I have punched in two holes on the top and two holes on the bottom opposite the handle for my twist tie. I know you're gonna to go to a lot of websites that talk about winter sewing. So many of them say to use duct tape around. Well, first of all, duct tape is not gonna allow any light to get through that portion of it. And it's total overkill, a one-time use of something that's not compostable and totally not necessary. These containers do not need to be hermetically sealed. So after we have punched, uh, after we have cut it around, here we have our hinge. And what you can do in the sink, I do it over my drain. I'll puncture four holes in the bottom of this. And I'm going to go down my drain, taking out my strainer so that I don't ruin that. Or if you have something smaller, like, like this is one of those, uh, those organic girl super greens, I will use my drill. So we have a drill, hand drill, which is pretty easy to use. And we have the container. And I'm using a base of uh, foam packing. I mean, certainly we've all gotten Amazon packages, right? So just uh, put it on there. And drill the hole through. So you're probably going to want about six or eight holes on the bottom and about eight or 10 holes on the top here. You want all the holes to be going down. So like for instance, on the top, you don't want it to the water to, to um, gather around that hole that you've punched up the wrong way. So everything should go down. Okay, um, are we? So also like um, I use a, just a sharp, an owl, an owl, A-W-L, and I just punch holes through on the bottom. Very easy to do. The type of plastic you have in your container that's really gonna dictate how, um, how strong you're gonna need to punch the holes. So a drill is always a good option. Otherwise, if you have something that like milk jugs don't take a lot of force, at least for me. So just, just punch holes in there and then you'll be good. And we can also use a uh, screwdriver. And if it is, uh, if the plastic is a little harder to deal with, then you can always warm this over the stove or a candle to get this a little warm to help you get that, uh, that oomph that you need to get through the plastic. So if you're using a clamshell, you also want to put holes on the top, like Jan mentioned before. So I'm just going to put um, a few on here. And I did, I, I thought ahead and actually took off my, the label, which is nice. I did last year and um, on a couple of them, 
because I was kind of in a hurry and I thought, oh, it's going to be no big deal. Yeah, it is because there was a nice little hole in the center of my, of my seedlings that it, it didn't, nothing grew up because that's where the, the label was. So it really does matter. Thank you for the testimonial. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm like, ah, oh, fine, it'll be fine. That's not fine. Okay. And I have my clamshell prepared. This is my Aldi uh, organic spinach. I was in here before. Okay. Should we put the dirt in? Uh, let me go first since I yeah. started first. So the way I do it, Cynthia's going to show you a different way. The soil does need to be moist before it goes outside. So what I do, because while I love my hands in the dirt, I don't like to be in the mud so much. So um, I'm going to have on my kitchen counter a bag of dirt in my kitchen sink, this time with a strainer in. I'm gonna fill this up with water. I'm gonna use my hose, the kitchen hose to get it all wet, plant the seeds, cover them with dirt if it's required. I'm going to tie it up together. I'm going to label it. I label mine with numbers and then I have a spreadsheet in the house that tells me what's in there. And then, we're going to get that wet again if we need to. I'm going to put it in my bin here. I'm going to take it outside so it drains all the way through, and then it goes outside. And then Cynthia will show you the other method. This so, is fun for kids. Oh, this is, this is great for kids because they take ownership, they take responsibility for it, and they really think, this is mine, I planted this, and then they can literally watch it grow. They, and they don't have to do much to it, which is nice. <laughs> Indoor seeding, you know, your seed starting, it needs a lot of babying, but this doesn't. So it's really perfect for kids. So um, I like to label my containers before I get even any dirt in there um, because I use a, um, a paint pen, just like a Sharpie paint pen. And so I put, I'm going to put butterfly weed in here. So I put butterfly weed and I put the date and I also put it um, on the bottom because just in case something happens where this wears off, you have it on the bottom too. So labeling is really important. You may think you're going to remember what you put in there. There's a good chance you want. And I'm another walking testimonial about how important it is. Because the first time I did it a couple years ago, I thought, ah, oh, okay, I'll remember when I get home to, to write what I put, or what, what I, um, I, I went or sowed. And I didn't remember. So it was kind of like, hmm, what is this seedling? So it was kind of exciting to see, kind of like Christmas. What did I get that spring? And it turned out to be Black Eyed Susans, but it really is important, especially if you have multiple containers, to, li to label what you have. Okay. So while Cynthia is uh, filling that up, I will talk about my story about the paint pen. I did not know early on about paint pens, so I just used a magic marker. And I had a twice the size of this pan. I had a turkey roasting pan filled with seeds. I lost the marking of it. Um, I didn't, it faded on the top. I didn't do any marking on the inside. I had no idea. I did not recognize that seed. So I planted it anyway. I must have wanted it. I planted a whole bunch of them. So I watched it be green all that summer, nothing. But the next year I got a load of foxgloves because that's a biennial and it blooms in its second year. I still have descendants of that, but really and truly, you don't want 20, 30, how many containers you're going to wind up doing uh, to be a big surprise because that's not, that's not fair to the plant either. It wants to go in the right place. So mark your containers using a paint pen. Now, regular Sharpie markers uh, will probably fade in the sun. Um, I've had, if you can't get your hands on a paint pen, then um, I've had some luck with just a regular Sharpie marker on a piece of tape. Um, as long as the piece of tape is, um, it was like a painter, like a blue painter's tape, um, as long as just a little bit of it, because you don't want to block any sunlight going into it, but I was able to you know, put what it was and just like put it on the side. That seemed to work. It, it didn't fade as much as if I had just written it on the plastic container to begin with. So. Here we've got a packed um, soil. I really made sure it was compact. I wanted to uh, give it as much soil and nutrients as possible for the seeds. So, how's that one? Did, Jen, did you put soil in yours? I did not do that now, no. All right, so let me uh, share the screen here. Go back. Okay. 
Yeah. Oh, yes. Also, before you use your containers, just rinse them out. You want to make sure any milk or you know, vegetable residue is clearly gone. Um, Chan showed you how to cut them in half. It's the same process that she went through with the milk jug. You can also do with two liters and um, uh, like vegetable oil containers or juice uh, containers. Drainage holes we talked about. Ventilation holes. And then um, as Jen also mentioned, the punching holes on the side, um, this is, it makes sure that the holes align. And so you can easily put in the, um, the twist eyes. Labeling, Oops. again, labeling is a big deal. And also you'll get a copy of this presentation in like two up slides format. So uh, this is a lot of information. So um, we wanna make sure that you can refer to it when you actually do start winter selling. So add the soil. And then um, sometimes you can, if you, if you, if you forget to uh, water or moisten your soil beforehand, then you can um, do it after you've planted your seeds. It's a little less muddy that way, but there is a risk that you can um, spread the seeds everywhere if you do too much of a, a jet of water, but you would do that by bottom watering, which is, which Jan showed you have like an inch of water or so in a container, larger container, you, you set your uh, winter sown container in there and the water will soak up uh, what it needs. Okay, so when it comes to adding the seeds, um, the big piece of information you wanna take away from the seed packet is how deep to sow the seeds. Um, some of them will say surface sow, like Jan mentioned before, which means you just, it needs light to germinate. So you just wanna just put them on the surface. Um, sometimes it'll say uh, a quarter inch down. Great, just put it a quarter inch down. So that's very important. Um, but the rule of thumb is um, you want to make sure, oops, there we go. You want to make sure that it is twice. You want to deep, the depth should be twice the diameter of the seed. So, and we have um, examples of what that is in a, in a couple more slides. Um, but when you do add seeds, you want to make sure that you add a little bit more seed than what you think you'll need. Um, and make sure also that there is good contact with the soil. They really, you do really do need to push them down. And then um, after that, then you would water. And as I mentioned, what, uh, doing a, especially if you're working with kids on this, watering like with a, a big stream of water or like a big jet of water, that is going to send your seeds everywhere. And then um, um, sometimes depending on if they're really little seeds, they'll sail right out of the container. I've seen that happen too. So you wanna be very, 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 very cautious with that. Okay, so here we go. This is what I mentioned before about how deep to sow. Um, fox gloves. It, they're, they're like dust. Carrots are like that too. A lot of lettuce seeds are, they're almost like dust. So you wanna make sure you just pack them right into the soil surface. Um, marigolds, sow them just under the soil surface. Um, bachelor buttons, same thing. Now a little bigger seeds like pea or corn, um, you wanna get them about a half inch down because they're about a quarter inch across. And then coneflower seeds, they're a little smaller, about a quarter inch down is good. Okay, so then after you would sow the seed, then you would close the container. So I'm going to um, stop the presentation so we can go to, so we can see Jan. Okay, and I'm uh, not real careful with this container, but it's not planted. I just wanna show you that we're going to string up with the, the twine for the holes and just tie a bow. And this is as good as you need to tie up a, a water or milk jug. This is perfectly fine. I've not used tape on these jugs for the last three years to no difficulty. I still have my 95% success rate, so. Yeah, I sewed about 200 containers last year and maybe, maybe four or five of them didn't work. So that was the good news and the bad news. I'm like, oh my gosh, I, it all worked. <laughs> so what am I gonna do with all this? But I figured it out. Okay, what I have here are, a neighbor gave me some butterfly weed seeds. And so I'm going to sow these in this container here. So I, I scattered them just on the surface. Um, and I'm not really all that picky when it comes to spacing things out. Some people really have to be very specific about spacing things um, the way they want, but 
for winter sowing for me, I like to add a little bit more than what I think is necessary because as they grow, we'll be able to thin them out, especially as we're getting ready to transplant them. Okay. Maria, you don't want to dump an entire container of 100 radish seeds in one milk jug. Uh, so you want to plant enough. I mean, you can go over a lot over with something like alyssum because that's kind of a ground cover anyway, uh, parsley as well. You don't need to measure those seeds out because they're certainly very tiny as well. So uh, the bigger the seed, maybe the fewer in there so that you, you will be able to deal with them when it comes planting time. But uh, otherwise, like Cynthia said, just be a little bit kind of generous with them because you can deal with those later. Yeah, so I put about, probably about 30 butterfly weed seeds in here. Now, the only time that I actually do care about the spacing of a seed is when I do tomatoes. And when I first heard that you can actually winter sow tomatoes in the Chicagoland area, I thought, oh, please, that's really? And it actually does work. You do that in April. And um, because you want to, when they're, when they're grown, the seedlings are big enough to actually start transplanting, you want to be able to take very carefully the entire plant and the root ball out. So I did space those at least like an inch and a half apart. So they didn't tangle up with each other. And it was very clear where the, where the plant was so I could easily take them out for transplanting. But for things like butterfly weed, I'm not so, not so concerned with that. Okay, right, let's see, I'm gonna share the screen. Okay, so now we're at the point we're gonna uh, close the containers. And again, like with a, um, a clamshell like this, we just have to do that, which is nice. No tape necessary. It's, it works really well. And then um, just make sure the top is secure. And then after that, it's time to place them outside. And I will water this afterwards. Um, I'll put it in, a, I'll bottom water it for about maybe an hour or two. And then um, when I see that it is completely soaked through, then that's when I'll put it out, it'll be later today. So in terms of choosing a place where you want to have your winter sown containers reside, they need to get at least a half day of sun. Um, they need to be in a place that is safe from wind knocking them over, children and errant dogs or squirrels. They can be kind of a menace. And then also a place that's going to allow enough some snow and rain because that is how your your seeds are going to be watered you uh, with jugs um, you want to, you're going to leave the top off and that's where the water is going to come in so you don't want to put them um, any place that is going to be blocking that kind of um, uh, moisture um, decks are good uncovered porches are good um, against a fence as long as um, there is sunlight coming in and i've also put them in a little raised bed that i have on the south side of my house i just i line them up in there it worked. And uh, north or east locations are best, but you know, anywhere that you have that you can get at least a half day of sun and it's protected from the winds and it gets the moisture, that's what's important. Okay, so a big old pro tip is do not put them under the eaves of your house or anybody else's house. They will not get enough sun and they will not get enough moisture and then you're going to have a bunch of containers that are just, it's just a bunch of dirt. The seeds will have died, desiccated. You will not even be able to tell where they are and um, it'll be a big fail. So do not put them under your eaves. And then um, the big, the third part is letting mother nature take over and letting them actually germinate and grow outside. And the picture here, this is, um, as I mentioned, the um, containers I did last year, this is my um, raised bed that I put them in and just let them sit outside until like May. Me. That's right. Okay, so <laughs> pretty soon, um, even though like, even when some of the spring nights are still freezing, you will see signs of germination in some of your more hardy um, plants, herbs, uh, natives, uh, vegetables that are cold hardy, like peas. Um, they are usually the first ones to come up and it is so shocking because your mind is, it, it's still, your mind is still wrapped around like, oh my God, it's so cold. I wanna go inside and I want hot chocolate you're not ready to see springtime germination yet. And it's really exciting to see that. Um, the, the, the containers will um, freeze and thaw um, as the temperature fluctuates outside. And this is, again, this is great. This is what the seeds need. Um, they're let to let their genetic code do what it needs to do to know when to sprout. Um, so uh, even though we're gonna put these outside and let mother nature take care of it, 
We do need to pay attention to them and, and add a little bit of care, not much though. You just wanna make sure that you see condensation inside your container. That means that it's warm enough and that means there's enough moisture for your seeds. Um, if you do not see any condensation when it's a day above like 32 degrees, you definitely need to water it. You can do so by bottom watering it like we described before, or you can do a little trickle of water on the side of your container, just kind of let, let it slowly go down and um, uh, water the, the soil. And don't worry about snow and ice, the containers or your seeds need them. Um, the soil should look like a moist brownie batter. And as temperatures warm, you'll probably want to move them to a little bit more shade because it can get really, really warm in those because we're making, these are like effectively little greenhouses. So it can be about 20 degrees warmer inside than outside and you do not want them to bake. Yeah, especially like, you know, some of those odd days when, you know, late February, sometimes March, sometimes it can be really warm. Sometimes it can be super windy and then get really cold again. Those kinds of like sunny, warm days, you really want to make sure you keep an eye on them so they don't dry out. And if it looks like they're dry, they probably are. They just need to be rehydrated. And like 2012, when we have that whole string of 80 degree, warm, sunny, windy days in March, that was when I needed to pay attention to the watering. And as she said, bottom watering is kind of easy. If you get a big container like this, fill it with water, stick the uh, containers, your planted containers in it, and then it will uh, absorb the water from the bottom and rehydrate the whole thing. So that's pretty easy. And the fact that you've not totally hermetically sealed these milk jugs allows for a lot more water. If you're going to water from the top, will allow some of the water to come in the sides that way. That's right. Also, um, I've used like cookie sheets or like jelly roll pans, baking pans to water also like Pyrex, like casserole dishes. I have a couple small ones. Um, those work really well as well. So if you don't have anything like quite like Jan is showing, then you can use those uh, everyday kitchen items. Okay. Oops. Okay, so uh, when daytime temperatures are like 40 degrees and above, keep an eye on them. Um, when they're 50 to 60 degrees, especially when it's sunny, you can even open the tops for a few hours, close them up at night because it's going to get really, really cold. And especially the, the, the tender or non-native plants, they are, they're not going to like that. They're nice and warm during the day and all of a sudden they'll freeze at night. That could, could put them into shock and then hope maybe not make it. So um, when seedlings get big enough where they're bumping up against the lid, whether it's a, a flat one or like one that has some headspace, you can open up the top and let the, the seedlings um, grow even further. Uh, that happened to me last year with a bunch of, of, of spider plants or cleomies. They got really, really tall in a, in a good way. And it was really, it was very obvious when I saw them poking out of the top hole um, that it was time. Okay, so then the last part of the process, when your um, plants get at least like three inches or so, it is time to transplant them. And this picture here is from um, me last year. We've got phlox on the top, um, lupine on the bottom, and then liatris, um, the super tall one, uh, meadow, I think it was the meadow blazing star. That gets about five feet tall. That's on the very far right-hand side. Okay. So generally, um, you can start planting these little seedlings out when the ground thaws and when the seedlings have their second or third set of leaves. And then sometimes you can wait a little longer, you know, it just depends on when the conditions are right. And then Jan, you have a lot more experience than I do when it comes to, you know, testing when it's time and when it's too early. So you add your pearls of wisdom. Uh, sure. Well, when the weather is, when you're going to be planting everything else, it's going to be warm enough to be able to plant those directly outside. Cynthia planted them in containers and you can do that too. You could plant uh, like natives or perennials in those separate containers and take care of them, water them all summer and then plant them in the fall. And then you've got a really, really sturdy solid root system on that plant and fall planting is a lot easier on some plants. Um, but if you don't want to do that and you want to put them directly into this into the ground, well, you can uh, put them individually in the ground, or you can do hunko seedlings. Is that our next slide? Um, 
Oh, well, you want to know where you're going to plan things, but, uh, but hey, we're gardeners. I change my mind five times when I'm outside. So, but it's always good to have an idea, a plan ahead of time where you're going to put these and a, a place where you know you'll be able to take care of them because all new plants need water in the beginning. So, um, so pick your spot. And then if you're not going to do it individually, some plants will be big enough to plant individually. For some, we can just take a hunk of it. Like parsley and alyssum and any other kind of ground cover is perfect for that because it doesn't need an individual plant. And if by chance it did, the strongest of those would be the one to survive and, and the others would just become mulch. So you can take a hunk of the alyssum or the parsley or whatever else you might like to do and just plant it in the ground. So um, things like that that are that small do not need to be individually planted. Yeah, because it would, be, it would take a long time to tease out the root systems for each one of those and that's just time not well spent. Okay, um, something to note is that winter sown plants will start out smaller than what you're used to seeing from a greenhouse grown plant. Um, they're gonna need to be watered once they're in the ground, even though it's chilly outside, they're gonna need watering. It's something that I don't think about because it's cold, therefore things don't need watering, but they absolutely do. If the soil is dry around it, the seedlings are definitely gonna need it. Don't forget about them. Even though they're little, they're gonna be growing, they're gonna be playing catch up really quickly. Okay, so we have several references for you um, for, about the overall um, seed starting, pro seed sowing process, um, and troubleshooting as well. Um, these are some things that um, we have been asked about as well as encountered on our own. Uh, like for example, uh, if you have green stuff growing on your surface, especially when it gets warmer out, that's algae. Um, that means that it's too wet um, or the, um, the air is too moist. And so you wanna give the containers more sun and less water. And then also you can scrape the algae off of the, the surface and just put it in your garden somewhere. Um, sometimes only some of your seeds will sprout and you'll wonder why. That's normal. Sometimes seeds take longer to grow than others. And also sometimes if they're sprouting way earlier than you think, that's okay. If it's a warmer spring, they'll be coming up faster. If it's a cooler spring, they'll come up later. Again, their genetic code is going to tell them when the right time is to, to uh, sprout because they're not gonna sprout when they know they can't survive. So they're only going to do it when they know that they can survive. Um, if you don't see any condensation, that means that um, there's too many ventilation holes um, or that maybe they're too large. So you can cover some of those up. Um, or sometimes you can, um, if that's the case, you can put a clear plastic bag over the top, especially over like a jug or a, a, a beverage container um, and secure it like with rubber band or something. And that will enable um, the, um, uh, the water or the, kind of the, uh, the moisture to stay in your container. Also, if you notice that this, it's your, so your soil is really soupy, it's heavy, um, or there's standing water in the container, that means there's not enough drainage. And you need to fix that pronto by putting more drainage holes on the bottom. Um, also, you need to check your surface that you're putting your containers on. Sometimes it's not porous. Um, and the, the water that runs out of your containers has nowhere to go. Also, if you put your um, winter sown containers in a larger container, I know some people do that, make sure that that larger container has drainage holes. Otherwise, you know, you're just gonna have inches and inches of water just accumulating and those seeds are just gonna get waterlogged and die. And if you notice that your container is super light, like if they're getting blown over by the wind and it's not because they're too tall, that means that the soil doesn't have enough moisture in it, it's too light and just water it thoroughly. Okay, so now we have a, a handy guide about what you can sow and when in our area. Um, and our area is zone five. Um, so January and February are the same. You can do uh, natives as well as perennials, hardy annuals, hardy vegetables and herbs. And hardy means that these plants can withstand a light frost. Not necessarily a killing frost, but they can withstand a light frost. Um, inversely, the tender plant is one that will be damaged by frost. Um, your warmer weather um, vegetables like um, tomatoes, plant or uh, peppers, eggplants, corn, things like that, those are tender, veg or tender plants. Now March, you can start doing more tender annuals, uh, tender vegetables and tender herbs. 
And in April, what I call the warm weather vegetables, again, like tomatoes, that's the right time to do that. And you may think it's really late because you know, we're starting to see, you know, 10 inch, you know, high uh, tomato plants in big box stores by that time. And it doesn't matter. Those are greenhouse grown. They're, they started in February. It's okay for you to start them in April here. They will grow and they will catch up. And I have always planted most of my stuff in January and February. And kale uh, is something that I see the first. Usually it's the first one that I see that turns green. But I don't usually do that much in March. I pretty much get it all done in January and February. So, you know, there are rules and then what they say is best. And then there's, there's real life when you have the chance. That's when you do it. So that's okay, too. It's good to experiment. So here's uh, some examples of what you can sow in January and February. Um, tons of natives. There's hundreds more um, of, than what I have listed here. And a really good resource for this is wintersown.org. Um, the woman, Trudy Davidoff, who is behind this whole movement, um, she has a very comprehensive list of things that you can winter sow in every zone in the United States. Very nice. Um, one thing that I grew last year, I did a lot of poppies and lupine, and they grew beautifully. A lot of success. Um, same thing with um, pansies and petunias as well. Uh, vegetables. Yeah. What's that? I'm sorry. Sweet peas as well. That's when I started in 2008. That was what I really wanted to grow because I never had a lot of success with sweet peas. So I planted a lot of containers of that, and it was amazing to me. So much so that I doubled it the following year. So uh, sweet peas are not on that list, but they're a good one to try. Yep. Um, also peas, like regular garden peas, kale work well, cauliflower, cabbage, you know, those kinds of vegetables. And then herbs, a lot of people forget about herbs. Um, a lot of people think, oh, they're exotic. They won't last year. We have um, quite a few herbs that will overwinter. I have a wonderful oregano plant outside that I winter sowed a couple of years ago and it's big and beautiful and it comes up every year um, and sage as well. So thyme, cilantro and lavender, you can also start. Let's see in March, again, this is more the tender time. Um, zinnias, marigold, um, sunflowers, cosmos. Jan grew unbelievable cosmos and zinnia last year. Um, and she put them as a natural fence border around the giving garden that we work at over at the Naperville Garden Plots um, as part of our Master Gardening Volunteering. And instead of having a fence, a, you know, a physical fence, she grew enough winter sown um, cosmos and zinnia and marigolds too, I think, that it became a beautiful natural fence. And it was very effective and beautiful and attracted all sorts of pollinators. So, so did you grow those in flats or, or containers, Jan? Uh, I did both actually, just to experiment, and then I got kind of uh, lost for time, so I I did a, do a lot in flats, but um, not winter sowing. But I did have my greenhouse set up at that time, so they were done outside rather than inside. But uh, yeah, winter sowing is good for for cosmos as well. Yeah. Um, also, like lettuce and beets and radishes are really good for that. Also, people have done carrots. I personally have not had a lot of uh, success with carrots but a lot of people have. And then, then you can start doing a lot of basils, rosemaries, and parsley, more of those, those tender herbs. And then um, in April, again, tomatoes, beans. Um, some people like winter sowing beans. You can, but it's, I think you could just also direct sow those as well. Those come up fairly easily. Um, also pumpkins and cucumbers. The only thing that would caution you on are, are peppers, either hot or sweet. Those can be a little iffy because they require a long time to produce the fruit. So sometimes it may be best to uh, start those inside, but if you've got pepper seeds and you wanna try it, why not? Go ahead um, and you'll learn a lot from that. And again, there's a, a bunch of, there's tons of resources online, especially on wintersown.org on the different things that you can plant at different times. And the only kinds of seeds that we do not recommend are um, um, tropical plants. Those tend not to do very well here in winter sowing. So again, with winter sowing, because of the, the very, very, very low cost and low risk associated with it. You can try so many things that you wouldn't think that, oh, I don't, I don't want this to fail or if it fails, it's gonna set me back. Try it, you never know, it could work. And um, this here, uh, where it says a winter sown garden, this is the side of my house. And all of these plants that you see, with the exception of the, the fuzzy um, asparagus in the back there, I 
threw all those from winter sown seeds. Um, the tomatillos in the upper left and the tomatoes grew beautifully. They kept producing until the end of September, beginning of October, producing beautifully. Um, Black-eyed Susans, those are the ones that I didn't know that I had the first time I, I grew them, so that's them. Um, the sunflowers, you don't see the very top of them because they are 15 feet tall. Um, so that, that's the, the stalk of it. Um, and the cone flowers in the back there in the upper right, those were winter sown as well. So it's, um, it's amazing. You can put together so many things and um, uh, people think that you've spent you know, thousands of dollars at a local um, uh, nursery, but no, you haven't. You've just spent about $7.50 on winter sowing things. So here are some examples of plants that um, are winter sown. And these are everything except for little pine I grew um, from winter sown seeds. Those are beautiful. The zinnias and cone flowers and poppies, they're, they're, just, they're beautiful. Uh, the the, the tithonia or Mexican sunflower that we saw earlier, that came from that plant. Uh, columbine grow beautifully. Um, again, there's another zinnia. I like that one. You can tell I have a couple of zinnias in here. Pansies as well, it's a no brainer. And the question is, can there be too much of a good thing? Personally, I, I don't think so. I think if you're gonna do it, do as many as you can, do as many as you have, you're comfortable with doing, um, that you have time for and, and see what works because there's really not a lot of effort put into it. Um, and here are some resources for you. Um, the University of Illinois has some really excellent resources for you if you have questions or you know, if you wanna see other people's experiences. And there's a, you can scan the QR code and it'll take you right there or there's the uh, website for you. Also, I mentioned uh, the Winter Sown organization. Um, that's the URL for that one. Also, there's um, a really very big um, community in Facebook. There, it's Winter Sowing. Jan, are you a member of that one? Or do you ever- No, I'm Yeah, yeah. I, I, I haven't by, I'm not a huge Facebook user, but I, have a, I was wondering about something and boy, I mean, it is extremely active, especially now. People all over the United States and the world um, are winter sowing, and it's a, it's a really robust conversation on there. And if you have questions, not only about winter sowing, but anything else uh, throughout the year when it comes to gardening or horticulture, always please feel free to contact us at the Master Gardener Help Desk. Um, and that's the, um, the website, or I'm sorry, the, um, our email address. And then, as we mentioned earlier, there's a uh, tons of programs and events that are available um, from that website, as well as the QR code here. And you know, here's just an example of some classes that just recently happened, everything from winter tree um, ID webinars. There's lots of classes for kids. Um, and then like the next one coming up on the 24th, there's saving money on food. There's also a lot of um, classes on health, finances, uh, small farms, backyard growers, um, beekeeping, anything that you could think of, Extension has got courses for that. And that concludes the presentation. So let's see if we have any questions. So oh, the link for the recording to this meeting, Xavier will have to send that out to you. And I think we covered the second question, what is a good time to plant uh, two winter so different things? So. I think we've answered that. If not, let us know. A question about can we use an egg carton? No. Um, no, I think it needs it need to have at least four, three to four inches of soil for your seeds. Um, so we wouldn't recommend that. And then, oh, the question about like that's asparagus. I thought it was dill. Yes, that dill is another great. Um, um, herbs that you can you can um, winter sow here, and it, it boy it takes off. I used to run the, my kids' school garden over at the elementary school until last year, and there we had one dill plant a few years ago. And now we have the dill forest, and I kid you not, we literally take a machete and hack our way through all the dill plants, and it smells so good. The swallowtail butterflies love it. So dill will be a, a prolific grower in your garden um, if you decide to grow it. Let's see. So, question for you guys: So, are you guys going to winter sow anything in the next couple of weeks? I know I am. Jan, are you going to be doing any more? Uh, of course, I'm going to be doing more. I've got a little bit over 80 now, and, and I will do more. I, I do a lot of native seeds, too, in case anybody wants to do natives and wants to know how long they need to germinate. 
you can call uh, or log on to prairiemoonnursery.com and ask for their catalog and cultural guide. Inside their cultural guide is sort of a recipe book mm -hmm. for 200 native plants and the conditions they need to germinate. So, so um, milkweed needs 30 days to germinate. Baptisia actually only needs 30 days to germinate. So it doesn't need to go in just yet, but it can. I did mine already. And, um, and some need 90 or 60 days or even 120 days. So those seeds that need 120 days and now it's already February, you could put those in a moist paper towel in a plastic bag and put in the refrigerator and count 120 days and then you can plant that out in your yard. Great. Okay. Okay. No more questions, I think that's it. Oh, Thank just you. real quick. Yeah, no we're, uh That was a wonderful presentation. Um, also uh, in the middle of March, late March, we will, um, our seed library will, will uh, go back into high gear again. Um, we, get seeds from Seed Savers. Um, that's a really wonder, wonderful one that my predecessor uh, originally worked with them uh, to get our seed library started. We also have seeds from an organization or not an organization, a company called Everwild Farms. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for patrons who are, for anyone who is interested in get, uh, getting their hands messy with, with seeds, um, you're more than welcome to visit the library and check out up to five seeds of your choosing from our seed library. And um, that should happen towards the middle of March, toward or middle to middle end of, of March. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. How many years have you had that? Uh, we, it looks like it kicked off in 2015 by my predecessor. Um, it's been going on for, yeah, going on for about five years, give or take a couple of years because of, um, yeah. And um, it has uh, changed hands a couple of times. Um, yeah. That's good. Do you accept donated seed or you just get them from uh, the companies? We get them from the companies. We, we are open to, if you know what the seeds are um, mm -hmm. and let us know, we always try to, we, we say that we don't knowingly uh, share patented seeds because then there's a, a crazy, crazy legal um, issue with sharing patented seeds. Um, we always try, try to do our best to share heirloom and, and community grown um, items. Yeah. That's been cool. And again, we will be sharing this presentation with you. You'll be able to, Xavier, uh, send it out to all of your participants. So. Yes. Oh, and there is another question about uh, fabric containers. If um, And what do you recommend for fabric containers? Fabric containers? Yeah. I, I don't know what that is. Um, I think fabric yeah. is going to fall apart in, um, in the weather. So um, I have used, there's like these, these um, like fabric pots. They, have their, they actually keep their shape um, and they're porous. And I've not used them for winter sewing though, but I have seen videos of people who do. As long as you have a cover over it and it's secure, then um, it should be okay. Because like like um, I have like grow potatoes like in a bag. It's like you know the 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 grow bags. Um, oh, the grow bag. That's what the the participants talking about. So like the grow bags. I mean it. They last all summer outside, and so mm -hmm. they they would last for the winter too. As long as you they're definitely porous enough. Um, as long as you have a good solid uh, cover over it, because that's what really needs to help generate the heat to bring the greenhouse effect in, and it's worth trying. I uh, would for winter sewing though, you'd have to uh, enable that to get some snow and rain in there. So mm -hmm. I don't know what kind of cover you could devise for that, but I'm sure you can jerry rig pretty much anything together. Yeah. So, yeah, like, yeah, like rubber bands and like a thick, clear plastic rubber bands and with some holes in it. And try it, see if it would work. And then someone else is asking about when to uh, sow squash and eggplants. When, when to winter sell squash and eggplants? April. Yeah. Since yeah. that's more tender, that will do much better in April than if you were to do that now. And then do you put on the cap on the milk container? Or no, milk container? absolutely not. That cap is recycled because you want the rain, the snow, the sleet, everything to get in that container. So do not hermetically seal that. 
Cap goes off. And also, you know, don't be afraid to let that, um, um, to let your, your containers in all the elements. Um, I, we ran, Jen and I ran a uh, winter sewing um, workshop at the school, the uh, elementary school, and um, lots of people, like 30 people were there, made lots of great containers. And then a couple weeks later, we had a, a big snowstorm and rain and ice. And a couple of people were very proud to tell me that they rescued their containers and they brought them inside. So they didn't go. I was like, no, 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 you need this. This is what you need. And they're like, really? I'm like, yeah, that's, that's part of the deal. You just got to leave it outside. But people are so used to fooling around with you know, seeds inside that they sometimes they just can't stop themselves. But just let these outside. Let Mother Nature take care of it. Just make sure it has condensation. It's got water. It's not knocked over. It's got sunlight. You're good. Oh, oh yeah, Everwild. Uh, yeah, I think, that, I think that's the right website, Everwild. Uh, if not, you can do um, do a Google search on Everwild Seeds, um, and the, they'll they'll come up. I've ordered from the, them before. Really nice seeds, reputable company. I don't recommend getting seeds off of Etsy. Just saying. Um, I was telling Jen this last year, and she's like, Etsy, really, with all these different beautiful seed companies online. Mm -hmm. So there are seed companies who do sell through Etsy, but if, I mean, if it's almost a reputable, that's good. But if it's something that maybe not then I would recommend not going there. I find it's something totally different than what came up with that. And if you get strange packages in the mail, right? Wasn't that going around? Uh, do not plant anything you get mysteriously in the mail. So yeah. that came from China. So yeah. mm -hmm. you don't want to introduce anything invasive or harmful here. So make sure you get reputable stuff. And Etsy people can really can put anything in and say anything about it. So really go with a reputable company. All right, well, thank you so much, uh, Jan and Cynthia for a wonderful presentation. This presentation will be available uh, soon um, through our uh, social media channels. Also endeavor to send it to those who registered for the program, which you're more than welcome to share with others. Thank you so much. Um, have fun winter sewing. It's the perfect weather for it. It's still <laughs> snowing. I see a bubble outside right. the window. Yeah. Perfect right. timing. Yeah. Bye, everybody. Bye. Take care.